Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for uh, these precious people, Lord, an opportunity to gather. <coughs> no doubt as our conversations have continued, Lord, that uh, we are under attack. But those are good signs because that means that that the devil finds us to be, uh, we're a threat. And that's where we want to be, Lord. We want to be in your good graces, Lord, that you are working through us to make impacts on other lives, to make him the enemy, and to make him jealous, and to make him worried about what we're doing. And so, Father, go before us today as we get into your word. We speak about um, what is on our hearts here, what you've put on my heart, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would bless this message, Lord, that it would bury itself in the hearts of those who are here and those who will hear it at another time. Father, we are so blessed of your love and your grace and your mercy, Lord, your providence, Lord, and we look to you in, in, in worship and in praise. And so go before us, uh, hear, our, hear our prayers and hear our words, Lord. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> you are in Genesis 17, and today we're going to finish out Romans chapter 2, and we're going to talk about an, an incredible topic, the topic of circumcision. And I get it. I know what you're asking. I've even titled this message, Circumcision, What the Heck? That's what we're going to talk about today. But if we're not careful, we're going to miss the boat. We're going to miss the reason why this is important. It has nothing to do with um, a surgical implementation that we do in our society, even all the way back to Abraham and even before that. The Jews did not start that. It wasn't, they weren't the first to do it. But if we're not careful, we're going to miss the point. And the point is, where is our heart before God? What was God telling us about that? What did he want us to do? Now, I got to tell you that there's not a lot of talk these days about circumcision. When I was a kid and as I've grown up, I've understood that it was either a tradition thing or it was a good hygiene thing, maybe a preventative health care thing. And then if you read the Bible, they talk about it. So it must be a religious thing here or there, probably in, in, in different places. But I never really paid much attention to it. In the Bible, it's a religious act. It's an act that built on a covenant, on a promise. And God implemented it to his Jewish people, to Abraham himself. But the problem is, is that the Bible sometimes seems contradictory in this. It's sometimes it's contradictory in what it says, or maybe it seems that way. Leviticus chapter 12, verse 3 in the law itself says, And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. God ordered children eight days old to be circumcised. By the way, if you weren't circumcised, then you were cast out of the people. You were left alone. You were not part of the Jewish population. That's one side of the coin. But Paul, to the Philippian church in Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, says, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of mutilation. And that's what he's talking about, mutilation. And I, that's a buzzword these days. You hear it in the news as we're talking about children being mutilated as they're dealing with gender affirmation care. But at this point, Paul is saying it's just mutilation. That's all this is. Now he's talking to Gentiles. But that gets us to this point where division was created. We even read about it in Acts chapter 15. When, when, when some Jews came into to Antioch and said, you have to be circumcised to be saved. And Paul said, no, that's not true. And so they came back to, to the Jerusalem council, to the elders of the church, and they discussed it. You see that in Acts chapter 15. But the problem is, it, well, it's easy to reject the, the teaching. It's easy to reject it if the Jews are supposed to do, the Gentiles aren't. You're not supposed to be talking about it. Nobody needs it to be done today, and it's just a normal thing of, uh, who cares? Really, how, when was the last time you even thought about that word? When was the last time you thought about circumcision? If you hadn't been reading in somewhere like uh, Genesis chapter 17. But the, here's, here it is. If you're not careful, you'll dismiss the teaching. 
You'll dismiss what God's heart is for his people. You will miss it. And that's the dangerous part of this because it isn't about removing skin off intimate parts. That's not what it's about. See, it's an intimate body part. And God said, well, all right, we're going to take a step so that you remember it for all time. We'll, as we'll see here in, in Genesis chapter 17, he tells Abraham, it's a sign in your flesh. Well, I could give you a coin. I could give you a diploma. I could give you all kinds of different things, make you remember what you're thinking. But those things get lost. They get brushed aside, put in a drawer. But you're looking at your body every day. And when is it that something doesn't 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 seem right in your body. You know yourself well. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, 29 says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. His whole idea was let's take an intimate part of your body and let's put let's make it a change. So when you look at it every day, you'll remember the promise I made you and what you are to do in return. And what's more intimate than the intimate body parts that we have? We actually have somewhere more intimate. We're talking about our heart. We'll get there in a minute. In a minute. See, it's a deeper, more intimate issue. And if we're not careful, we will reject circumcision and we'll lose the true meaning. But to set some foundation about circumcision, well, it's listed in the law only one time. It's in Leviticus chapter 12, verse 3. I read it to you earlier where... Your children are so your boys, your sons are supposed to be circumcised on the eighth day. Why it isn't discussed any more than that is because it was already accepted far long before the law. If you're in Genesis 17, you realize that this is the new nation. It hasn't even been born yet. And God is telling Abraham, this is the covenant. Make sure that all your men in your in your tran in your tribe and in your family are circumcised. So it's far beyond that. It's far. It was never before. It was before the law itself. So look at. Let's read through seventeen one to get an idea about why this is important. Genesis chapter seventeen verse one says, "When Abram was ninety nine years old." The Lord appeared to Abram and he said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. And then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. Now pay attention to all the blessings God is going to do in this next few verses. I'm going to make you many nations, a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Verse 6, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, and an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. No, I will, I will, I will, I will. Everything in here is given over to Abraham. I will stand here. Look at verse four. As for me, I will make a covenant, a promise, and I will give you these things. Now look at verse nine. God says, and God said to Abraham, as for you. Now pay attention. God says, as for me, I will give you these things. But as for you, this is what I need you to do. He says, as for you, you shall keep my covenant. You and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. 
He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male child in your generations. He who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Verse 14, and the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God makes it clear. This is called a bilateral agreement. It's a bi he, God says, I'll do this if you do that. Now, it's very, it's very lopsided. God is saying, I'm going to give you a nation. I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to give you all your people. I'm going to bless you and keep you. I'm going to bring you the Messiah. We read that in Genesis 12. All of these things I'm going to give you. I'm going to make you a nation. And there's going to be people, as many as the stars in the heavens. All you have to do is circumcise your boys so that you remember what I made this covenant with you. That when you look at yourself, you say, you know what? I'm God's people. I'm set aside and set apart. It isn't, oh, you know, we're going to do this, and this is, this is how you get saved. Salvation has nothing to do with circumcision. It has everything to do with a heart that you have set on living and loving God. This was the promise that he's made. That word sign, you'll see it in verse 11. The word sign in the old King James is the word token. And this is a cool word. It's the word oath. O-T-H. It means a distinguishing mark or a banner or a remembrance or a proof. Speaking of the rainbow, it's the same word used in Genesis chapter 9, verse 13, when it says, I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and earth. And if you're paying attention, Satan loves to come against these tokens and signs. How bad has the rainbow been perverted? How bad has those, how bad has the communion table been perverted? Paul speaks about it, by people <coughs> taking it in an unworthy manner. How about circumcision? How about, you know, all of this stuff? God's word is being turned and perverted in ways that take away its promises. God simply said, I'm going to put this rainbow in there so you remember I'm not going to flood you again. And, of course, Satan has to turn it into something that's not a promise. So that word is really interesting. By the way, communion is a sign, too. It's a picture of a picture. It, the Catholic Church thinks when you take in the bread, it turns into Jesus in your body. It, that's a false teaching. But we remember when we take it who Jesus is and what he did for us. It's a sign. It's a token. It's a peace of our remembrance. It's it's kind of like a tattoo. Now I'm covered in tattoos. And my tattoos have stories. Like a, this one here that I read, it's a blue line that comes to a point. The word on top is Greek for it's the Greek word charis, which means grace. And it's filled with Genesis 24:27 which says, "As for me while I'm on the way God led me." Grateful that God got me to the end of my career and I, and I came out in good shape. I can't deny it. It's on my skin and it's always there. And I always remember that God has delivered me through some hard stuff. And he's promised to do that again. That's what this is. It's like a tattoo that you see every day and remember that God has made a promise for you to be his people. And if you just want to throw in something cool, the number eight, they're circumcised on the eighth day. Numerology in the Bible tells us that eighth means a new beginning. It means a new hope or a new creation. Other eights, eight people on the ark. The name Jesus is 888 in Geminatra. We know that, that he was resurrected on the eighth day. After the thousand-year tribulation, 7,000 years of people will have gone by. The, the date of 7,000 years of human existence will have passed. We start the eighth day into a new Jerusalem, a new beginning, a new place to come. And we want to remember that. 
The problem here is, is that the Jews thought circumcision was a sign of salvation. It was a badge of honor. If I go and do this, I'm saved. It doesn't matter what else I do because I'm circumcised. I'm of the chosen people. It wasn't a heart issue. It was a works issue. And if I just go do some work, then I don't need to do what God has called me to do, which is love him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Reminds me of a police badge. I wore a badge on my chest so that you knew that I was a bad. When I came into a place, you, it set me apart. But the power that I had as a police officer wasn't behind my badge. My badge was a trinket. The state or the city or the government gave me my power. These, the Jews are looking at it as if I went to get a badge out of a Cracker Jack box, and now I have all the power in the world to do whatever I want. That's not how this works. The only reason I have a badge is so that you see that I'm set aside, set apart for a different special a, a, a reason, good or bad, but I'm set aside for that. So instead of being a token... For God's special people, this, this understanding that God said, I want you to remember my promise that turned into an idol. And they idolized it. it it's, a, it's a lot the same as, as we see in Numbers, where all these fiery serpents are killing the Jews. And Moses makes a bronze serpent on a pole. And he said, look, look upon the, the serpent and you'll be saved. A picture of Jesus Christ. But we learn later in Kings that, Hezekiah had to destroy that thing because they were bowing down to it. It's a picture of something else. It is not an idol. But circumcision quickly became an idol. And if you read through Jesus, hammers on these guys for this stuff. Because they believed they were, if they were circumcised, they were sons of Abraham. And they were untouchable. And that's not true. And we also know that it, it isn't works. Just two chapters before, in Genesis chapter 15, God gives the first Abrahamic, the Abrahamic covenant, right? I'm going to make you a great nation. And what do we see? Abraham believed, and it was counted to him to righteousness. It was faith, not an action. He didn't go get circumcised, and that changed everything. He believed God. It's no different now. We believe in Jesus. It is faith that, that brings us to be born again of Jesus Christ and not of works. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 tells us that. We see that even in Deuteronomy, God knew that men were going to fall into this problem. God knew that it wasn't, it wasn't the snipping away of skin that was going to be this big deal. He knew what it meant. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16 says, Therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. If you want to read it in the New Living Translation, verse 16 says, Therefore change your hearts and stop being stubborn. <laughs> but that's exactly what they were doing. This is, this is a slicing away of the old me that this was supposed to be. They wanted to make it a physical act. It's not. It's a spiritual act. God knew it, and he wanted you. Your heart doesn't have foreskin on it. He's just making a point that it's a heart issue. It's an intimate issue. It's a deep relationship issue with God. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6 says it even better. It says, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to the love the, the, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. And I see that as prophetic. Because when Jesus came and died and you accept him at his free offer, he, being born again slices away the old you. It takes away our sinful nature. It puts us in contact with the God of heaven who cares so much about us. See, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 24 says this beautifully. It says that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. 
circumcision is really not a lot much than baptism. Baptism doesn't save you. How many people, oh, I've been baptized. I got, I got water sprinkled on my head when I was a baby. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. How does that, it does, nothing biblical about that. But, but baptism is a picture of being buried with Jesus and being risen up again. It is an, it was, it's an outward view or an outward activity that shows an inward change in ourself. You saw hundreds of people out at the reservoir make a commitment that you're a witness to. That's what God is going to with, with circumcision, with baptism, with communion. To see things the way that God wants you to see them, to remember that he is our blessed hope. Take off the new man, take off the old man and put on the new man and cut that stuff away from your heart. Be holy as I am holy. God tells Abraham, walk before me and be holy. It's a hard issue. It's way more intimate than your physical body. But see, the, the Pharisees wanted to make it a works thing. People want to do something and feel like they earned it. And after the diaspora, after they were taken away to Babylon for 70 years, God had over and over and over told them that if you don't stop messing around and come back to me, I'm going to have to judge you. They did. It happened. You could read it in Ezekiel and Isaiah and in Jeremiah. They wanted, so, so these guys came back. And they came back over a couple of different times through Ezra and Nehemiah, and they came back to rebuild the city. Well, they wanted to do something, so they inflated the they inflated the law to make it more oppressive. Instead of saying, "God, we're at your service now," we understand. We we didn't understand before. They just made it harder. And so they took those 237 or so, whatever rules, they turned it to 613. And now on Sunday, you can't push an elevator button because you're working. You can't walk more than three quarters of a mile. Remember that story? Jesus and the disciples are walking, they're hungry. And so they take that, they winnow that, they, they take some grain and they winnow it and eat it. And they, they get in trouble because they're harvesting on the Sabbath, and Jesus just railed on him for that. See, instead of saying, all right, God, what do you want to do? They said, we're just going to work harder to make sure this doesn't happen again. And they dropped, they dropped the hammer on the people. See, Paul understood this. Uh, and so you can go to Romans. <clears throat> and in Romans chapter 2, with the longest intro on, on, on planet earth to lay the foundation. See, Paul understood this. Now we've been going through chapter one, dealing with sinfulness, people that didn't believe in God, how the, how, how judgment is coming for people who suppress the truth. In chapter two, we've been talking about the fact that religious leaders are doing, are, are doing one thing and saying another, that they're teaching one thing and saying another, and then they're walking around with all this power trip and they're holding it hard on people. All of this oppression, and Paul is saying, you got it wrong. Your impression about what circumcision means is wrong. We pick it up in verse 26, uh, 25 of, of chapter 2. Paul writes, For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. The argument continues. If you can keep the law perfectly, you don't need Jesus because you're a sinless man. And if you're going to keep the whole law, then keeping circumcision is part of the law. And that's okay. It works just fine for you. But we've talked about it before. Chapter 3, verse 20 says, Therefore, by deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. Well, you can't keep the law. The whole point of the law was to show you you couldn't keep it. That you needed a Savior. That's why it was so hard to keep. You can't even keep the Ten Commandments let alone all 613 laws. And these guys are saying, well, we're circumcised and we're children of Abraham. So we're good. And we have the power and the authority to talk to you about it. 
Paul's like, what, what do you mean? If you can't keep the law, then your circumcision is worthless. It means nothing to you. Verse 26, therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his circumcision, uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Well, what if you're a Gentile and you keep the whole law? Then, but you're not circumcised. Does that make you a lawbreaker? <laughs> like, this is a great argument that he's leaving here because it's so silly on its head. The idea that this medical procedure is the only way to go and it makes you somehow special is, well, it's ridiculous. And because we've talked about the fact that Romans is a beautiful, the it's a theology thesis about, it's a dissertation about how to defend the gospel. He's got to spin these guys on their head because they don't see the truth. Verse 27 says, and will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? Ouch. That Gentile guy who doesn't have your law and doesn't have your customs and doesn't have all that information, but but he keeps the law. And by the way, the law is written in your heart. So if you just be, if you accept Jesus at this point and you do what is good, they're going to judge you. Is that fair? Paul's, Paul's argument's great here. He's just trying to show them that this is silly. You need to see, you need a savior. You need to see Jesus for who he is. Your mistake of falling into this idea that power hungry, oppressive activities gives you right to judge other people is not, and you will be judged accordingly. We see that up in the first beginning of chapter two. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. Now, now he's he's throwing the gauntlet down now. Because everybody up until this point have begun that, well, circumcision is an outward thing, and this is what brings me to salvation. But he's saying you're not a Jew outwardly. You're not a Jew. Being circumcised doesn't make you a Jew. It doesn't make you a special person. He says in verse 29, he says, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Paul, Paul goes after these guys and says, you, you think this is what is special about you, and it's not. God never meant it or never intended it for to be there. And if you want to walk around and say that you're special because you're, you're of the children of Abraham, you see that in the New Testament, Jesus rails against that a little bit, then you're wrong. You've seen it wrong. You understood it wrong. Get your heart right. Get back in the word and read it. Understand who Jesus really was and circumcise your heart from your sins, not your body from its skin. That's what he's saying. That's quite the, see, this is le it's legalism. Mm -hmm. The definition by Merriam-Webster of legalism is strict, literal, or excessive conformity to the law or to the religious or moral code. I'm sorry? Yeah. It says strict, literal, or excessive conformity to the law or to a religious or moral code. At the bottom there, in green. These guys, these guys took this stuff heavy. And then they put it on everybody else. You feel like the government's dropping on you heavy now? But they were, that's what they were doing to the people because they didn't want to be drug away in some other judgment by God. They, miss, they missed it because it's all about what you do. But in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus comes after them. And I've read a number of pieces of that. Uh, I'll read a couple more because you need to see Jesus' heart. The only people he got angry at. The only people he got angry at were the Pharisees. He accepted everything except the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 23, verse 4 and 5 says, <clears throat> For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear, and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. 
but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the, the borders of their garments. It's all a show for them. All of this was important just to be seen as pious, to be seen as holy. But that's not where God wants you to go. He wants you to go in your prayer closet and close the door and be with him by yourself. Because it never was a physical thing. God doesn't look at the outside. He looks at the inward. Samuel learned that early when he was looking for the king. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23 and 24 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. You realize that when you, if you look at justice and mercy and faith, those are all heart issues. Caring for people. You worried about all those things that look good. Giving in tithes, going to church, making sure you're praying. All of that stuff that makes you look good on the outside. He continues in that and says, you're just... You're whitewashed tombs, but you're full of dead man's bones. There's nothing inside you. Justice and mercy and faith are the most important in God's heart. Make sure you're equal. Make sure you are merciful to others and have faith in God and have faith in Jesus. These were the same words used when, when the Pharisees went against Jesus for, for winnowing the, the grain. It's like you... Haven't you heard that David was hungry and they gave him the show bread? He's not supposed to eat it, but he was hungry. You need to wonder about the mercy and grace and faith. Understand what that means, that I desire sacrifice over works. Jesus' burden is easy and the yoke is light. He doesn't want us to hold on to man's oppressive rules. Men were holding, if you read in there in Acts 17, I'm sorry, in, in, uh, in the Jerusalem Council, um, you, you'll see that they were trying to hold these people, hold burdens on these people, the Gentile people. And they finally came to the understanding that, gosh, Peter, Peter was there when the centurion, the Holy Spirit came upon Gentiles. They weren't circumcised. I've been, Paul's like, Paul and Barnabas are walking all over, said, I, we've just been watching things happen all over the nation and all over these areas. They're not circumcised. God's obviously moving without it. And James finally stood up and said, okay, then we're going to forget about that part. Let's not put that on them. Let's just worry about sexual immorality, choking animals, drinking blood, eating things that are given over to idols. That's stuff that is that is a, a bother to us. Let's just put that in this letter. We'll send it back to them, but they don't need to go and cut themselves all up. And mutilation, mutilation. Thank goodness the Jerusalem, the Jerusalem council understood these things, that it wasn't of God's heart to do that. By the way, we're not circumcised anymore. Now we have the Spirit. The Spirit rests in us. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We don't need to have a token anymore. He lives there. And you feel his presence. Don't, don't think that today this isn't happening. Don't think this kind of behavior is happening. Don't think it's like, well, you know, we don't worry about circumcision anymore. Or how about baptism and tithes and going to church and doing good things? Ah, I tithe every week. I'm, I'm good. That doesn't mean anything to him. I'm grateful that we live in a church that doesn't pass plates. There are people demanding, well, I gave most money last year. I want a plaque on the wall in my honor for giving to the church. But there are churches that bow to that. There was a ceremonial bench out in the courtyard because such and such gave so much money to the church this year. He's so pious. That's, that's, it's a heart issue. I love Ezekiel chapter 36, 24 to 27. It says, For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. And then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. 
And I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments and you will do them. That's a beautiful picture of being a new creation. Being completely changed. I can tell you this happens. I can tell you that the little rocks are taken out of your heart and you're softened. That the spirit rests upon us. That you would walk in passion. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us that we're a new creation in Christ. All things have gone away. Behold, all things are new. This is the change that God was looking for at the circumcision with Abraham. I'll give you all these promises. I will give you all these things. You just worship me and be my people. And I'm going to ask you to do this so that you remember. That's all that was. That's all that was. I want to close with this uh, passage in Galatians. Galatians 3, verse 23 to 29. In the New Living Translation. It says, Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Basically, what he's talking about is, is that the law was, was, would, the law was administered, one, to show you your need for a savior, your need to pull close to God. It gave rules that you could follow so that you wouldn't find yourself into such dark, decrepit days that you couldn't get out of it. He said it protected you and your heart to trying to be at least somewhat religious and stick close to God until the fact, until the fact he could send Jesus to die. Once Jesus died, everything changed. We, we see that in Acts chapter 17. I love this. I think I probably bring this up all the time, but Acts chapter 17 was the change and 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 everything that had happened because up and up until the point that Jesus died God just kind of put up and put up dealt with the sinfulness of everybody going on doing their own thing but Jesus came to die for the world everybody was saved from their sins when Jesus died now it's only an acceptable you just have to accept the gift and when that happened, God said, okay, that blowing it all off, blowing off salvation, blowing off Jesus, blowing God, it's done. There's only one way and one truth and one life to be saved and get to heaven, and that's through Jesus. And we see that in Acts chapter 17, verse 30, when it says, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. All men everywhere. To repent, not just Jews, but Jews and Gentiles as well. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He's going to judge the world based on a, a comparison between them and Jesus. You can't hold up against Jesus. You need to have him wash away your sins. He says that you will have to be, it says, uh, he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. He proved it. He proved this was going to happen and that he had the power to happen and Jesus is the man because he was raised from the dead, which had never happened before. And now that we are raised from the dead by accepting Jesus to be our savior, we don't have to face that. We understand by slicing away the sinful old man nature in our body. He continues in Galatians in chapter, in verse 24, he says, okay, let me put it another way. He says, the law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could make right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. 
You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. It's not about circumcision. It's about accepting the man who came out of the lineage of Abraham. You are a son of Abraham if you have accepted Jesus Christ to be your Savior. That's the whole point of all of this. The gospel brought down, whittled down to one point. Jesus Christ to save you from your sins for eternity. It's by faith and not by works. Nothing you can do. The man hanging on the cross didn't need to be circumcised to be saved. Didn't need to be baptized to be saved. He didn't need to be all of these things that we get all these platitudes. And yes, they mean something to us. And they they give us opportunity to show our faith to others. They not they have nothing to do with your salvation. Nothing to do with your salvation. Instead, as I've said it often, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 is the choke point of all things. Seek a relationship with Jesus. He, he says himself, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. It isn't the works you do. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to search for it. You don't have to go in out there. Ephesians 2.10 tells us that he's got all these good works for us. They're all lined up there for us. We were made to do them. You seek Jesus, he'll lay them all out there in front of you and then be obedient to do what's being done. And it would be remiss if I didn't mention that time's drawing close. Time is near. All of the spiritual warfare we're battling is a sign that things are getting better. They're going to be better for us even though things are getting worse. I have the idea and the belief that God is bringing hard stuff on his Christians so we will let go of this world and be ready to go. So let's hasten his return and be ready. Let's take as many people as we can. Get into people's lives and let's get them, let's get this taken care of. Time is short. Time is ridiculously short. All of the stuff that is happening around us, even clearly, to everything that has, it, it doesn't, it's, it's, it's unspeakable how tremendously accurate the Bible is and what it is we're looking for. So pray for Israel, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, pray for each other, and let's do all that God has called us to do, a heart fixed on him, not on silly things that, that mean nothing to what we're doing. Amen? Amen. Father, grateful. Father, thank you, Lord, for the day. Thank you for the message. Thank you for your word, for your grace and your mercy, Lord. We we praise you and we worship you, Lord. And we are, I, I am often taken back to the story of the 10 lepers, Lord. Let us be that one that comes back and fervently thanks you as much as we fervently prayed. Because you do things in our life that that we can't explain and they're so wonderful. We praise you and worship you for that, Lord. You know us. You know every hair on our heads. And you know our direction. You know our waking up and sitting down. You know that what is in our hearts and what is in our minds and what comes on us. Give us courage to stand the gap. Give us courage that you're looking down upon the earth to and fro looking for someone who you can show yourself powerful for, Lord. Let us be those people. Let us, let us see you for who you are and get our, our eyes on you and our heads up and countenance high to get people to ask questions and seek after us so that we would tell them about you, a conduit of your love through us to others. Blessed Father, thank you for the day. And we pray that you would bless us and keep us. Go before us, straighten our path, and be our rear guard. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.